it's my pleasure to introduce you Ofer Dekel, who is principal researcher at Microsoft Research in Redmond, where he leads the machine le learning research and optimization group. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It's a pr uh, pleasure to be here. This talk is going to be uh, a little bit different than the previous two. I'm a machine learning algorithms person and a member of the learning theory community, so there's going to be some math and uh, you know, some hardcore machine learning. I mean, if we're going to start a dialogue, then I want to bring you into my, into my house so you can see how, how we make the sausage. Um, <clears throat> and what I'm going to be talking about is machine learning on the edge. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so there's a cloud. Uh, and there's an edge. When you're a cloud, you work for a cloud company, then uh, you know any kind of device is called the edge. Um, and uh, you know today, a lot of the AI is done in the cloud, and the edge is a dumb edge. All the sensors and uh, you know do the sensing. You have cameras, you have stuff, and they send it up to the cloud. That's where all the action happens. Uh, and this talk is going to be about changing that. So what does the cloud look like? So the cloud has you know machines like this. Nvidia is, is the king of the cloud right now. Uh, this is Nvidia's uh, GPU box. So um, you know eight big powerful P100 GPUs. Uh, this thing can do 85 uh, teraflops. And actually hearing you know Bill's talk, maybe I should have uh, done all my calculation in 16-bit float rather than 32-bit float. But you'll see it won't change anything. I mean uh, you know the point will stay the same. So this is. Uh, you know, a very, very powerful supercomputer. And one of the most important and impressive things is the power efficiency. So this thing can do, uh, you know, more than 26 single precision gigaflops per watt. Uh, and that's what we do in the cloud. So this is what enables us to do all this wonderful AI in the cloud. Uh, on the other hand, the edge uh, devices. So when I talk about the edge, you know, sometimes the edge can be a beefy computer. If you're talking about an oil rig or maybe even a truck or a train, uh, you know, you can have a little rack of a few computers in there, that'll be the edge. But more and more often, we're talking about uh, edge computing, which you know has the power of, of something like this, like a Raspberry Pi 3, so that's an ARM Cortex A53. Uh, and here we're talking about the Internet of Things, we're talking about devices. Uh, you know, We're looking at a future where we'll have multiple AI devices, many of them on our body, on our clothes, uh, some of them in our cars, in our homes, in our workplaces. And these things are going to be you know, more and more running on these uh, you know, very cheap, low power, uh, small Cortex uh, A and M processors. And we'll talk more about those in a minute. So this thing, uh, you know, if you work really, really hard and put you know, OpenSUSE, you can't, if you use the standard Raspbian op operating system, it, it kind of sucks. But if you put a good operating system on there, uh, you'll get about half a, um, a gigaflops in, in single precision, uh, which is you know, more than 100,000 times less powerful than, you know, the computer in the cloud. So it's very, very weak uh, processing power. And moreover, the power efficiency is much worse. So about 500x uh, less power efficient than what you get in the cloud. So this talk is going to be about how do we take the AI and the machine learning and move it from the powerful machines in the cloud to these really, really resource impoverished devices on the edge. So here's the outline of the talk. Well, first, why do we want to do that? Why is it you know, not satisfactory to always do our AI in the cloud? Uh, then the second question is going to be, why is it going to be hard? I mean, why is it even a question that an algorithms person like me is interested in? Uh, and then we'll dive into kind of the more machine learning parts and talk about the two approaches that we uh, use. I'll talk about the first one more than the second, and then I'll uh, plug a little compiler that we're building. So that's the outline of my talk. So let's just dive right into it. So why do we want to predict on the edge? <clears throat> I think Bill touched on this a little bit. So a primary reason is latency, right? So if you imagine a smart uh, bicycle helmet, you know, it looks behind me, tells me when a truck's coming up, uh, you can't afford to wait those 500 milliseconds of the round trip to the cloud. So latency is a huge factor uh, in desire to push AI to the edge. Another one is reliability. I mean, usually when you have a helmet like this, if you think about it talking to the cloud, it's typically going to talk over Bluetooth with my smartphone, and then it's going to talk over LTE to some base station, and then it's going to depend on a bunch of networking stack, and then it has to make the round trip back. And I don't know, I don't want to trust my life to, you know, my Bluetooth uh, uh, connectivity being on or my, my smartphone uh, having, you know, enough bars for, for the signal to go on. So latency and reliability are big. Privacy. This one is huge. So, you know, think of an AI teddy bear like this one. So it looks around, recognizes your kids, calls them by their names, says what it sees. Uh, so kind of creepy and cool at the same time. But the, the real creepy thing would be if real-time video from my daughter's, uh, you know, bedroom would be streaming to, to a cloud, even the Microsoft cloud, which is, you know, good and trustworthy. I don't want my kids, you know, uh, 
getting dressed or whatever, being there and trusting the corporations to, to protect that data. So that's privacy. And then sometimes compliance, that's a legal issue, right? If I have anything like a smart hospital bed or anything in a government building or a military base, I'm, I'm just legally not allowed to stream that anywhere. So it has to stay, all the data has to stay on-prem. So those are kind of the two aspects of privacy, you know, the ethical one and just the legal one. So that's another reason to push AI to the cloud from the cloud to the edge, sorry. And then the third one, which was also mentioned in the first talk, is just availability. I mean, if you think about predictive maintenance in a truck that's going through the desert, uh, trains, ships, uh, again, oil rigs. We were talking to a, a company that runs smart oil rigs. Uh, they have connectivity 20 minutes every six hours. That's when the satellite flies overhead. So you can talk to the cloud, but you, know, you have very little bandwidth, and you can, uh, you, know, you can only do it so often. So you need to do all the predictive maintenance. You can imagine the predictive maintenance you want to do on an oil rig, right? You want to know that uh, the thing isn't going to uh, blow up. So you want to do that on the edge as well. Uh, another one that I didn't mention here is bandwidth. But anyway, a bunch of reasons why we want to push it to the edge. More and more applications like this are, are coming up. And this is you know, the focus of, of my work for the past two years uh, and, and a huge focus from Microsoft as well. So on to the next question, well, why is it hard? I mean, can't we just take the networks that we already have compress them a little bit and push them you know, onto these devices. So let's talk about that. And I want to talk about that through the, the prism of, of a case study here, uh, which is, so my dream is to build a little uh, camera in the button of my shirt. So I wanted to look around. I wanted to remember where I left my keys and where I put my phone. Uh, you know, did I, did I close the garage door? Uh, when I meet one of you, I'm, I'm very bad with faces. I wanted to kind of whisper in my ear your name and, you know, where we met last time and, you know, what, what, your kids are just starting college or whatever, you know, just to start the conversation. So this is my button camera. And let's talk about that. So I want to do com computer vision on the edge. And, uh, you know, as has been mentioned a few times today, the tool for this is convolutional neural network. So let's see how easy would it be to build a camera like this. So, you know, again, the same plot that you've seen before plotted a little bit differently. So there's been an exponential growth in the test time or in the running time cost of these convolution, convolutional neural networks. Uh, and again, the numbers I have here are a little bit different than the ones before, but it's not going to make any difference. So you know, don't worry about factors of two in, in any errors. So again, as the years have gone by, our accuracy has improved linearly, uh, but the, you know, the cost of evaluating these has grown exponentially. So you know, the state-of-the-art models are using between you know, 25 and 30 uh, gigaflops just to render one, uh, one image. And this is going to be the core of our, of our difficulty to push these things onto the edge. So let's do the math. So again, you know, let's just round up and uh, say that one image on Resident 152, which is our big you know, state-of-the-art computer vision model, takes 30 uh, gigaflops for one image. So that big GPU box that we saw before, right? it had uh, about 85 teraflops. And just due to division, it can handle about you know, 3,000 images a second. If you want to do this in 16-bit uh, precision, maybe it's twice as much, but this is the order that you can do. On the other hand, that Raspberry Pi that was running a Cortex-A, this thing has enough juice to do about one image a minute, right? So you can't do any kind of uh, close to real time or any kind of realistic scenario on that device right now. So um, how many images do we want to do? Well, you know, you want to do something like 15 or 30 frames a second. The way that we handle big frames, uh, so, you know, either we can, uh, as Bill was mentioning, just increase the frame size, but more typically what you'll do is you'll have a gating layer that will identify interesting regions of your, of your uh, you know, big frame and cut out, carve out little images to send to this high-tech, uh, you know, state-of-the-art neural network. So you'll probably do something on the order of two to five images in each frame. So, you know, depending on how, what your frame rate is and how many, images, how liberal you want to be in sending these images to the neural network, you're going to send, you know, between tens and hundreds of uh, images to this network. Like a second, let's just use 75, just to be a little bit conservative, right? So this is the rate that I would r like to run at. So again, you know, the powerful eight GPU uh, monster box that we saw before can handle 38 live streams uh, at this rate. And uh, the Raspberry Pi is about 4,500 times too slow to handle even one stream, right? So we're way, 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 way off. So even if my numbers are, you know, 2x, 4x off, we're just, there's just no way to run these state-of-the-art neural networks on the small edge device. But this isn't the end of the story because, you know, maybe we'll wait a year and, you know, NVIDIA will come out with something better, something, you know, twice as fast, 10 times as fast. Will it solve the problem? So let's look a little bit deeper. So pretend that we solve this problem, right? Pretend that we can build, you know, Raspberry Pi 4 will be 4,500 times faster than Raspberry Pi 3. So it'll be fast enough to handle one of these streams, right? So imagine that. And moreover, we said it's about 500 times less power efficient than the most power efficient machines that we know. You know, maybe, maybe we can close that gap as well. 
So we can make it not only 4,500 times faster, we can make it 500 times more power efficient, as efficient as you know, the, super, uh, the supercomputer in the cloud. So could we solve the problem then? And the answer is still a resounding no. And that's because at the end of the day, we want to power this thing with a battery, right? So this is, again, a camera in the button of my shirt. The most similar product we can think of that kind of already existed was, was the, the Google Glass. Google Glass, you know, you could peel back the plastic and look at the battery. This thing has, you know, a two watt hour battery in there. And again, if you do the math, even in this miraculous, fictitious world where we can squash down the giant GPU server into a tiny little processor, you would deplete the battery in 89 seconds. So there's just, you know, orders, orders of gap even in, in the miracle world. And by the way, if you try to deplete a battery like this in 89 seconds, it would probably, you know, uh, you'd, you know you'd, you'd blow up. Uh, so that's not very good for something that's on your shirt. So, you know, we're just, we're just orders away. We're just, uh, you know, vastly far from where we need to be to, to build my, my magic little uh, button camera. Yeah, is there a question? Yeah. Um, why do you care about images per second? Um, let's say you have a button on your shirt and you want to infer something. The scene is not going to change that much in a second. So isn't one image per second good enough? Well, I think enough? that if I'm walking around, you know, at the break, and I have to detect every single face, I want to see every single glass in everyone's hand. I want to know, you know, I want to record. If I want a, a memory of what happened, then yeah, it's going to change pretty rapidly. And it's true, there'll be, you know, downtime. There'll be nighttime when everything's dark. There'll be, you know, times when my shirt is hanging on the, on the hook and, and nothing's happening. But when stuff is happening, it can happen very, very fast. Actually, 75 images per second, I think, you know, for a wide, if you want uh, to capture, you know, an entire scene is pretty conservative. Okay. All right. But anyway, this is just back of the envelope. I mean, don't take this you know, too seriously. It's just saying, this is why, you know, this is just like the general motivation. If we imagine AI being everywhere in little buttons and, my, and you know, in a little hearing aid in my ear and in my shoes and so on, we're gonna need to do much, much more than you know, where we are today. And hardware alone isn't gonna solve this. What's gonna solve this, in my mind, is, is, is algorithms. And that's why you know, I'm here talking about, my, about algorithms and, and you know, how we can solve it that way. So, okay, so let's ju jump into it. <clears throat> so, we're trying to compress machine learning. We're trying to get prediction. We're also trying to compress the learning itself. But in this talk, I'm only going to talk about compressing prediction and pushing the prediction down to the edge. And we have two approaches to this. So one approach is our top-down approach. So top-down approach uh, is the following thing. So we start from the big predictor. We, we start from a big model that's built for the cloud, and we try to compress it down so that it fits onto the device. This is in a similar vein to, to you know, uh, topics that have been mentioned here today already. Uh, and my team has worked on two aspects of this. One is pruning and specification. We've done this to deep neural networks. We've also done it for uh, large decision forests, which is also a very important class of machine learning models. Uh, but the thing I want to talk about today is, is about binarization. So binarization, again, is the process of taking a neural network with floating point weights that which you, you know, through which you pass uh, floating point activation values and replacing everything with one bitmap. And I want to call out a distinction here between two types of research. So I think a lot of people have been talking about retraining neural networks so that they have, uh, you know, binary weights. So basically you take the same uh, scaffolding, the same design of the neural network, and you'll run it, you know, through the, something which is very similar to the back propagation, to the training, you know, the stochastic gradient descent training process that you do to train the network to begin with, and you train it in a way that induces binary weights. So that's not what I want to do. What I want to do is I want to take an off-the-shelf neural network, something that's already been trained. For example, the winner of the, you know, the latest ImageNet competition or something. So, you know, a lot of effort has been put in that. Someone has run a crazy parameter sweep and got something really, really great with its weights, and I just want to mimic it. I just want to do one one quick pass without full retraining and binarize this thing. And the reason for this is because, again, there's this ecosystem of neural networks. You can download these networks, you know, many of them off of the web, um, certainly the winners of the competitions, and in my mind, this is only going to increase. So we're going to be able to download more and more of these. I want to download it onto my laptop, and without a beefy GPU, without access to a cluster, without full retraining, just in one quick sweep to binarize the thing. Okay, so this is uh, the topic that I'd like to talk about. And let's understand, um, exactly what this means, right? So um, now we're going to get into hand-drawn illustrations and some, some math. This is kind of more and more in my world. Um, so we have a neural network. It typically, typically looks like this. Uh, it could do convolution. It could be fully connected. It doesn't really matter. For the purpose of this binarization talk, you know, the secret sauce is going to be the same kind of algorithm. Uh, and typically what we have is we have real valued weights you know, they come down, this is the activation of, you know, each neuron here outputs this real valued weight. You'll we'll have a weight on each one of these edges and we'll multiply this activation by the weight. 
then we'll sum these things and run some kind of nonlinear activation function like a ReLU or like a, a sigmoid or something like that. And this is the activation of this other neuron, right? And when I talk to my hardware buddies, they say, listen, this real valued math is too expensive. Let's make it one bit. Let's make the whole thing one bit. So what would that look like? So basically, we add another step here. So um, imagine just for now that the input is still this real valued input. And it comes in, and the first thing is, it, that we have to do is threshold this, right? So we have to have some parameter. There's a threshold here, and one here, and one here. And basically, if this number is greater than the threshold, we set it to be plus one. And if it's less than the threshold, we set it to be minus one. So this is going to be a parameter of this layer. And then, so this, you know, x4 is the output of, of layer four. This is a real valued number. We compare it to what's written here as a real valued threshold. You'll see this is an integer in a minute. But, you know, let's write it as a real number right now. And then we get this. Uh, you know, one bit number, a sign, plus or minus one, just the sign of the difference. And then we multiply it by this weight. Now I want this weight to be binary again. So now the multiplication is something that I do, you know, with one bit. The truth table for this is just, uh, you know, has four entries. It's very, very fast to do. And that's why we love it. Still, we're doing this threshold compare, but we're doing it once. And then we do all these multiplications across all this bottom layer in, in one bit math, right? So I need to tell you how I find the threshold, how I find the weights, right? And then uh, the output is, again, Activation function applied to the weighted sum of these little bits. But now, also note that what am I going to do one minute after applying this activation is just threshold yet again. Right? So applying a, a threshold to a monotonic function like this, well, I could have applied the threshold without it doing the activation. Right? So there may be a different threshold, but I could have applied it directly to this thing. So in fact, um, you know, don't worry about the activation at all. And now using a more vector kind of notation, my output is just take the sign of the vector difference between you know, the output of the previous layer minus the vector of the thresholds, dot product with this binary weight vector. Right? The other thing to notice is that the output of this is always going to be a number between minus n and plus n, an integer, right? because if you take the, right, the dot product, this is all minus ones and ones. The biggest this could be is n, which is the number of um, neurons on the previous layer, and the smallest could be is minus n. So this is going to be an integer. So in fact, these comparisons are not floating point comparisons. They're integer comparisons with small ints, right? Ints uh, with log n bits at most. Good. So this is what we want to learn. So now, I mean, this is kind of the scary part, because I don't know if this is, you know, this is definitely, I'm, I'm, the next two slides or three slides are going to speak more and more my language. Uh, what's the purpose of this? I don't really expect everybody to maybe follow uh, every one of these steps because we're going to go very, very quickly uh, over them. But I do want to give you an idea of the way that someone like, like me would you know, approach this problem. I want to give you a sense of the mathematical sophistication that's required to solve these problems and improve over the current techniques. So as Bill mentioned, the low-hanging fruit has been picked. We need to do something clever in the algo space to solve this. And I'll try to give you a little idea of what that you know, cleverness, uh, mathematical cleverness needs to look like. So just for simplicity, and this is what theoreticians do, we try to find the smallest toy problem that still captures the essence of the, of the big one. Let's binarize one single neuron, right? So I have a neural network. It's already populated with real valued weights. I can pump data through it. I can choose one neuron and say, can I binarize just this one guy, OK? And as I pass data through it, I can collect the inputs to this neuron. We'll call those x. And I'll collect the outputs to that neuron, call that y. And I'm just trying to mimic that one neuron, but replace the floating point math with binary math, OK? So now I have a data set. And what I'm trying to learn is a predictor like this. So this was there on the slide before, but I've added these constants, c and b. So c is just a real number. b is just a real number. I'm adding them to the training. They're not going to appear in the final neural network. So I want to give the neural network, uh, sorry, I want to give the training algorithm the flexibility to you know, scale arbitrarily and shift arbitrarily just so that it doesn't get hung up about actually fitting these labels perfectly. I'm going to threshold in a minute, so it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, this scaling and this shifting, maybe it'll change the threshold that I'll have in a minute. But at the end of the day, I'm just going to compare it the next layer uh, you know, to some threshold and see if it's bigger or smaller. But uh, it's important to give the algorithm this flexibility so that it can, you know, uh, so that w and tau, the things that actually matter, aren't hung up about fitting these, these uh, labels. So I'm trying to find a predictor of this form. Again, tau is going to be a vector of reals, actually integers, but let's call them reals. We have a binary uh, plus you know, ve a vector of signs, and then these two uh, scaling factors that help us out. And what we're trying to do is just fit the data. All right, so we're trying to find a function such that the predictions of the function matches the labels. So that's what machine learning is. OK, so how do I solve this thing? 
So the first thing that a you know, algorithms person does is you try to formulate the problem. So I need to come up with a mathematical formulation of the problem so I know what it is that I'm solving. I can actually talk and reason about it. So the first thing I do is, well, as I told you, you know, I have these feature vectors, these activations for the previous layers, and I'm going to turn them into binary ones, right? So I'm going to compare each one to this vector of thresholds, and they're going to become binarized. So let's call Z the matrix of you know, these examples in their binary form, in their sign form. Uh, on the right here. So this, this, you know, this matrix Z is induced by the thresholds tau, but I can't get any matrix of plus ones and minus ones, right? It has to be a matrix that's induced by applying these thresholds. For example, if I have two examples and one feature value is bigger than the other, then if, you know, if that one's minus one, then the other one's going to be minus one because they, you know, they have to follow the rules of what a threshold looks like. So there's a finite set, there's a subset of all the plus one, minus one matrices that can be attained by this, and I'm going to call this calligraphic Z. So calligraphic Z is going to be the set of all attainable matrices. And this is my variable change. I'm actually going to optimize over Z inside calligraphic Z and forget about tau, but we can recover tau if we, if we know Z, right? So it's going to be a legal Z. And the second thing I do is I define a loss function. So the loss function is kind of the formalization of what we had before, right? So before we had this informal term, let's kind of try to fit the data. So we try to find a predictor that's roughly the same as the labels. So this thing is going to measure the goodness of the fit. So this is going to be a loss function, which is just defined as the, the mean loss over all the examples. The loss is defined by this L, which is just some machine learning loss. It could be you know, squared error. It could be hinge loss. It could be log loss. We have a bunch of different ways to measure you know, the goodness of, of a fit of a prediction and a label. So choose any one you want. All I'm going to need is for this thing to be convex. And this is a typical thing in machine learning. So um, you know, again, measuring the discrepancy between my prediction and the label, sum over the entire data set, average, that's what's going to be this loss function. So kind of the labels are baked into the loss, and this is going to be important in the analysis in a minute. And this is my optimization problem. So I want to find Z and W. Z is, again, the binarized version of my data, which follows the rules of thresholding, because it has to belong to this you know, specific set. I want to find the weights vector. I want to find these B and C that help me out, that minimize just my, my goodness of fit. And I'm going to add a little regularization term on the end, just to make sure that the, you know, the free variables, the real ones, don't get too big. So that's the formalization step. This is often the first step that you do when you devise a machine learning algorithm. Now this is going to be the, my most mathiest uh, slide. And again, the purpose is to show you kind of the, 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 the steps, right, the thought process. So first we formalize the problem, and this is called derivation, but it's really massaging. So I'm going to massage this thing, which to me is very intuitive, so I'm just trying to minimize a goodness of fit to the data plus a regularization, and I'm going to change it into something that maybe loses all intuition but is mathematically equivalent in which I can solve. So that's often the second step that we do when we derive these algorithms. So, I mean, when I look at this, first of all, it looks hideous to me. I mean, we have this combinatorial constraint. We're optimizing over a bunch of these variables. We're multiplying like three of them and adding the fourth one. It's a big mess. And this big hot mess is hidden inside this arbitrary convex function, which can be really anything that you want. So it's all kind of mungled up together. And it's really you know, uh, gross and hard to, to reason about. So the first thing I do as a, as a theoretician is say, hey, I want to rip these things apart. So I want at least my complexity to live in two different places. So I basically want to pull this complex term outside of the arbitrary loss function. And the tool that I use for that is a, you know, a standard tool from uh, convex analysis. So this is called a conjugate function. So every convex function has a conjugate. And you can write any convex function in the world in this form using its conjugate. The conjugate is something that you can compute. So we have closed forms for conjugates for many of the functions that we love. And as you can see, when we apply this, it immediately pulls all the complexity outside of, you know, your place L with L star, but it was kind of arbitrary to begin with, so who cares? Now we have this convex function of the simple parameter, and we've pulled the complexity out. So, so the next steps are going to be similar. I mean, we just do these mathematical tricks to simplify to the point that we can solve it, so let's just go through it real quick. Um, the next thing we do is we apply strong duality. So strong duality, I look at this and I say, man, min, max, well, it would be much easier if it was a max min. And luckily, we, we, we get perfect equivalence. So, you know, this function satisfies the mathematical properties that mean, means, mean, that uh, imply that minimizing and then maximizing will give you the same answer as if you do it in the reverse order. So we swap the order of min and max. Then we have this term. We say, oh, this is actually pretty nice because it's an unconstrained optimization problem. We're just optimizing over two real numbers. We have here you know, an unconstrained convex objective. We know how to solve those. We learned that in high school or in you know, undergrad. We just take the derivative and set it to 0, right? So we take the derivative of what's inside here and set it to 0, plug it back in. And we get something that looks like this. And now everything's negative, and that just annoys me. So I multiply it by, by you know, minus 1 or actually minus 2 uh, lambda just to make it prettier. And then we reach this thing, right? So now we have another formulation. And it, even if you didn't follow the steps, 
This is exactly identical to what we have up here. Up here is something that to me makes perfect intuitive sense. This thing, I don't know. I mean, just looks like a bunch of math. Yeah, go ahead. So that, I could do this. so that I could do this. I mean, in order to be able to uh, get, so notice that C and B have gone away. There's no more C and B. I've gotten rid of them just by solving analytically this problem uh, by taking the derivative and setting it to zero. In order to be able to solve this problem, I need to you know, have this problem. When there, before it was min of something crazy. Now, oops, now it's min of something I could just take the derivative and set to zero. Uh, but again, you know, the math details shouldn't, shouldn't uh, worry you about. I just want you to kind of, you know, see the, the, the painful process that we, we have to go through on, on our side of the, of the equation. Um, so now I have this thing. So I'm trying to minimize this thing. Again, it's a perfectly equivalent version to what I had before. But the nice thing is now I can do something with it. I can't solve it perfectly, but I can approximate it. And I can approximate it using an alternating minimization approach. So what's that approach? Well, I can fix z and w and optimize over alpha. Look at this thing. This is just a convex function of alpha. So I can optimize it with it, you know, not even constraint, right? I can use Newton's method. I can use an interior point method. I can use stochastic gradient descent or an accelerated stochastic gradient descent method. We have, you know, books and books on convex optimization. So if I fix uh, z and w, I can just solve it. The other nice thing is that if I fix alpha and try to optimize z and w, well, this looks kind of complex. But notice that these terms are just become constant because z and w don't appear here. So I'm just trying to maximize this one term. Alpha is now fixed. And then I can do with a simple combinatorial algorithm. So I can perfectly solve this using a few sorting operations. I basically sort alpha in different ways and try to find the biggest, uh, you know, the maximal prefix. And that's going to be my answer. So the technical details are, of this are, are, are pretty straightforward, but I, I mean, I won't go into it uh, more than that. Just, you know, believe me that it's, it's much easier to solve than, than actually this one. You just sort n times, you know, do a little operation, and you found the optimum. So I can alternate between these two steps. I do it a couple of times, maybe five, so not 5,000, and, and that's it. I'm done. So I have a great approximation to my problem. Okay, so this was again. This exercise was just meant to show you that you know there's there's a little bit more into it. If you want to, if you really want to recover the entire precision of a neural network with bits, you're going to have to do more than just round the numbers. Uh, you know, you really have to 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 do something which is. Um, so finding these thresholds is similar to what you know Bill was mentioning about uh, not not sampling uniformly. You're just finding one threshold, then you, you you learn it dynamically from the data. So if I can I can apply this to one neuron, I can apply it to an entire layer, and then I can recursively do this for an entire neural network. Good. Uh, so in the interest of, so if this was a machine learning talk, let me just say one more thing, I'll, uh, I'll get to the question. So if this was a machine learning talk, uh, I'd go a little bit more into the implementation details of the algorithm. I'd go into the uh, empirical study that we did, uh, which is actually quite delicate. So I don't want to just flash a, paper, um, you know, a slide that says that we're better than everything. There's kind of trade-offs here. Uh, but in the interest of time, I want to move on uh, to, to something else so that we can stay uh, broad. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually, <laughs> so that would, that would be, that would be, yeah, sorry, so the question is, uh, good, so this is not a problem that I know how to solve, and the reason why I don't know how to solve it is that this thing doesn't have that same strong convexity property that we had before, right, so to do alternating minimization, I should be able to prove to you that max min is the same as min max of this thing, and in this case, this isn't true, there's a duality gap. So in fact, you know, when I, when I say, um, you know, fix Z and W, solve for al alpha, that's legit. When I say fix alpha, solve for Z and W, that's cheating. But that cheat, we can bound uh, almost the size of it. Uh, so we do have some analysis. But here I also want to get to a different point. So one of my, you know, great mentors in, in learning theory is, is Professor uh, Manfred Wormuth from uh, Santa Cruz. And he would yell at me. I mean, when I was just a young student at, at, at NIPS, one of my first NIPS, he would yell at me, theory is just a hint. He would just yell this, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the corridors of the conference. And, and the idea is don't get too hung up on theory. You know, even if you live and breathe theory, even if you're a mathematician, it got you this far, say thank you, just try it, and if it works, be happy. So. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have gotten this far without the theory. And it's going to do better than if I had applied, you know, a silly heuristic like this, alternating minimization to the original thing, because that was just a hideous problem. So the theory did help. But, you know, the fact that I have a bound doesn't, doesn't uh, it's not what uh, makes or breaks this thing. Good. So let me, let's uh, shift gears. And uh, I give you, give you a little flavor of what we've done. There's an empirical study. We could have gone into it. Uh, I want to very briefly mention two things, and then I'll, I'll um, you know, kind of be wrapping up. So compressing big neural networks, starting from giant models and squishing them down, this will only get us so far. You saw the gap that I was talking about to begin with, right? It'll make maybe deep learning 10 times, 100 times, maybe even a little bit more, you know, more efficient, faster on the edge, on these devices. 
But it's not, uh, well, maybe, you know, who knows? But in my mind, this is not going to get us to models that require 1,000 or 10,000 times less compute and less memory bandwidth on, you know, these edge devices. And as I'll tell you in a minute, we're now deploying some machine learning models onto little 8-bit microcontrollers, like this 80 mega on the Arduino Uno, uh, certainly the ARM Cortex-M0. That's like in the middle of our range. For me, a Raspberry Pi and certainly a, like an iPhone or a smartphone, that's a supercomputer in my world, right? So Raspberry Pi is maybe the powerful one. Uh, Cortex-M7, M4 are pretty powerful. M0 is getting down there. But we're deploying onto these teeny tiny little uh, you know, things that have 2 kilobytes of RAM, 32 kilobytes of flash. They're super slow, uh, you know, and you buy them for, for a couple of cents. So I don't think that compression techniques are going to cut it. I think we're going to have to invent something brand new, and that's what we're actually investing a lot of our time on now. Um, as with neural networks, we're looking at techniques that were popular in the 80s and the 70s, and these things are making a, a, you know, a, a comeback in this space of resource-impoverished machine learning. So the fact that neural networks have killed everything else is, is not true. The fact that you know, GPUs are the answer to everything is, is not true in, in, in my neck of the woods. Uh, we're looking at decision trees. These are improved versions of decision trees. They're not the simple ones we had back then. So we use decision trees where you know, as you traverse the path of this tree, you're accumulating some kind of Fourier coefficients or doing something a little bit more clever. But at the end of the day, it's the complexity of a decision tree. Uh, we're looking at k-nearest neighbor style classifiers, right? So the classic, just to look at the, the points that are similar, but we're learning these points. And now we have techniques to find the prototypes that we compare our data to, and these are doing very, very well. Uh, these are actually things that are pioneered by my, my colleagues uh, in, in, our, in our lab in Bangalore, India. This is the one that I'm most excited about and working on myself. So I'm learning KDNFs. So you remember the disjunct disjunctive normal forms. So this is just a Boolean function, which is an or of ands, right? So it's just a Boolean function that says, uh, you know, the, the value is true if, uh, so, you know, I'll, uh, the classifier will say, yes, you're approved for a mortgage if your salary is higher than X and you've been a customer of our bank for more than you know, Y years and uh, you've never defaulted on any of your loans. Or uh, I'll say yes if you know, three other things and so on. That would be a 3DNF. Right? So, so we have uh, an or of logical ands. Each and has at most k literals in it. That's going to be a kdnf. So this is a really, really powerful, nonlinear, super compact representation of knowledge. We're getting huge mileage off of this technique. We sat now have optimization mechanisms to approximate the learning of these things. Learning them is, is very, very hard, right? So it's uh, actually, if you look 10 years back, um, the computational learning theory community love to prove difficulty results and possibility results on learning these KDNFs. Now we can kind of approximate them very, very well. So these old school kind of techniques are doing much, much better on these teeny tiny little processors than what, as far as I can tell, what the neural networks will ever do. Um, Neural networks are great, they're accurate, but they're very, very redundant and wasteful, right? We're looking for new hypothesis classes that pack much more predictive capacity in a teeny tiny small little footprint, and that's what these models are doing. So that's the one before last slide. And the last thing I want to say is, so that's, those are kind of the two approaches, right? Top down, bottom up, I think it's, uh, it's kind of uh, understood. Oh, I wanted, I wanted to mention about this. The type of problems we're solving here is not full computer vision. So we're start, it's bottom up. We're starting from small problems. We're starting from you know, optical digit recognition. So you only have 10 digit classes. We're, we're doing things like you know, detecting uh, uh, if, if, if uh, um, an audio signal is, is a whale um, you know, uh, singing its song underwater or not. So very simple classification tasks, but we're fitting those things in two kilobytes of RAM. Right? So that's the, the magic that's happening here, and we're scaling these things up, and hopefully we'll get to the more interesting problems soon. So my group uh, not only does theory and algorithms, we also do a bunch of engineering. Uh, we're soon to release uh, our compiler, or our embedded learning framework. So uh, it's called the Embedded Learning Library because we couldn't find a better name, uh, but we, we like to call it L. Uh, this is soon to be fully open sourced. Actually, it's already open sourced, but if you could do me a favor, please don't look at it right now. We have another release in a week, and then it'll kind of look half okay, but still, we have a gap between what we've released and what we have, and we're gonna release everything. It's really, it's not a legal thing. We just want it to be pretty before we push it out. Uh, this is a full cross compiler for embedded machine learning. So this is a compiler that knows that it's compiling machine learning and to do, can do a bunch of optimizations that a standard compiler can't do. Uh, it handles the entire intelligent pipeline, so all the way from the single processing through the feature extraction, the prediction, and the actuation. So this is important because if you're deploying onto a Cortex-M4 or an M0, there's no operating system. There's no easy way to program these things, right? So you want the entire pipeline to happen in kind of one holistic model, which not, does not only the machine learning, but also everything else. 
uh, with the timing and everything and so on. So this is uh, an environment that allows you to author these things and then compile and deploy them onto the target platform. Uh, we built it as an LLVM front end, so it can uh, support a bunch of different hardware architectures. So LLVM is this wonderful open source uh, compiler framework that we've uh, hooked into, and this is becoming more and more popular in different areas of machine learning. And although it's LLVM, which means that I can deploy into anything really, uh, it is optimized for the ARM Cortex A and M. So I class of processor, right? So I, I love the Raspberry Pis, we love the Cortex-Ms, we want to get computer vision down to a Cortex-M7, we want to do audio detection on a Cortex-M4. We're doing very, very simple uh, tasks, uh, tasks on an M0, and then these 8-bit processors is just a show off. So I don't think there's, you know, real value to that other than just showing how small we can get it. So that's what this thing is. Um, and, and the main challenge here is to use the no domain knowledge of machine learning to, de to you know, deploy correctly and to take advantage of the heterogeneous hardware on these things, right? So if you take an M0, M0 doesn't even have a floating point unit. If you go up to a Cortex-M4, now you have a single precision floating point unit and you have a little DSP on there. If you go to a Cor Cortex-M7, now you have a more powerful DSP and you have a double precision uh, floating point unit. So, uh, you know, all these different trade-offs, CPUs, floating point units, DSPs, vector instructions that become available only when you go up in the in that stack. Little tiny embedded GPUs that we can't program with CUDA, uh, or not that I know of. Um, you know, taking advantage of what you have there is really the key to this compilation process. So this is what we're building. And I think the importance to this community, and I'll just sum up with that, is the, is the profiler that we have in there, right? So our little um, compiler allows you to design your model, and then you deploy it onto Cortex-M0, you deploy it onto Cortex-M4, you deploy it onto Cortex-M7. It's a full cross-compiler, so you can do you know, all of the above. And you can profile this thing at a, at a micro level on the device on each one and find these bottlenecks. And this is important because a big question that you know, we get as, as, as Microsoft and as researchers as Microsoft is you know, what parts of the machine learning stack on these edge devices should the hardware accelerate? What kind of accelerators should we build? So this is going to give a pretty definitive answer to that. You know, you'll have a very, very fine resolution idea of where you're spending your time on each one of these devices. Uh, again, assuming the, or kind of not requiring you to do the manual optimization for each one of these platforms. So the compiler will do it for you and you'll just find the bottleneck. So this is uh, to be available soon. And um, that's uh, pretty much uh, what I wanted to say. So thanks. Thank you for sharing the enlightening session. Um, Two-part question, if I, if I may. So the first one was, uh, if you started with networks like SqueezeNet or eNet, some of the really highly compressed ones, and you tried the binarized technique, what happens when we talk about accuracy and capacity that someone else brought up? You know, the, these are issues. And then second is, these binary nets, are they executed as bit fields, like the XNOR net, or are they sums? I don't, didn't quite get that. Yeah. Okay, so, so um, the first question, approaching the capacity, and again, this is now just my, my personal opinion. Uh, you know, maybe Bill will d disagree. Uh, I think that the neural networks are extremely redundant and extremely you know, wasteful, if you want to use that word, and there's a ton of capacity to, to, to crunch. The low hanging fruit has been picked. You can't do it. It's not going to be a simple thing, but if you can do clever algorithms, if I could solve the sharp peak complete problem of actually finding the optimal binary weights for this thing, I, you know, I think it would nail the problem. You could make things much, much smaller. You know, if we could solve non-convex optimization problems better, perhaps we could, we could even improve on the real valid ones. So I think there's a ton of headroom uh, to work on. I haven't tried compressing squeeze nets right now. Uh, our, emp our empirical study, we have, you know, initial empirical results, but the study's uh, underway. It's definitely a good, you know, experiment to do to see how, um, you know, these different compression techniques trade off. And if you've already used one, can you use another one and still get the gains? So I don't have a great answer to the squeeze nets question. Uh, remind me, the, the second one was about, oh, the, the XNR, yeah. So for this binarization, um, well, first of all, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, okay, so we, we look at the problem as algorithm people, the problem is the math that I showed you on the board, right? Now you say, how do I deploy this thing? So in our compiler, we have uh, the, the um, you know, the ways to accelerate this on the ARM processor. So we're using everything that ARM has, uh, and it does look, uh, you know, like the math in the XNOR networks. Um, to some extent, we are doing things a little bit differently. Uh, when you deploy into an FPGA, then, you know, you just uh, wire up the FPGA with the correct, uh, you know, binary mathematics, which are, you know, occupy much less space than, than having little real, real uh, floating point units. 
Um, so that's another target that we're you know, seriously thinking about. Um, really, you know, our focus is on how to solve the difficult algorithms problem, the question of how to deploy it, and we're trying to build this, this, this compiler as well, uh, which solves the problem for, for ARM, but I think it would be very hardware dependent. I think that, you know, you'd have to look at this. This could be a very good example of, of you know, hardware software, hardware algorithm co-design. Somehow the problem was inspired by the hardware, but now that we have a solution, now you can go ahead and, you know, have that dialogue back and forth. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, hey. Uh, can you quantify the power for the architects in the room? Can you quantify the power limits of these devices that you're targeting or the, you know, cameras or whatever else? So, uh, yeah. I'm, so, I'm like, so, ideally, I'm, if I was going to build you an ASIC with everything you wanted in it, what would the, you know, power cap be? Yeah, I have no idea. Okay. I don't, I mean, I barely understand the question. Okay. <laughs> no, never mind that. I can make I can make real numbers at the bits. That's all I know. <laughs> so uh, that's loud. Um, you didn't give any uh, accuracy uh, numbers or yeah. uh, power. Um, so I was wondering. You ha you talked about the top down and the bottom up. Yeah. Uh, top down with the neural networks. The bottom up with the other algorithms. Um, What's the accuracy that you can get? Yeah, so, so here's, the, here's the reason why I didn't do it. I had a slide that was in here to begin with, which is the standard slide that you see in every machine learning talk. You know, here's me, here's everyone else, I'm so much better. But it really doesn't capture the, the, the essence of it. And to go into, you know, we're, we want to be scientists, we want to be you know, honest about, about things. And it, it really uh, is a much more delicate uh, kind of story to tell. Uh, these binarization techniques sometimes can recover, you know, the perfect uh, uh, precision of the neural network. Sometimes they are as good as techniques that require full retraining but are much, much faster to do. So, you know, if you're just, you know, uh, someone st sitting at home with your laptop and you want to binarize a neural network, you can't do a full, you know, GPU accelerated retraining with the parameter sweep required and so on. You need to be a big corporation or someone who has access to a big cluster or data center to do that. So we can, you know, our results vary between uh, being able to do what others can do with a giant data center on a laptop or actually, uh, you know, doing better, which is really, you know, not losing almost anything and recovering the full uh, accuracy of the neural network. So that's the compression techniques. Uh, but there's, there's some delicate issues there. We're also kind of in the middle of a more serious empirical study. So, you know, those results will come and you'll be able to see exactly. We'll release everything. Um, for the bottom-up approaches, uh, we can you know, solve, well, I don't know if you know the machine learning problems, you know, the MNIST digit, op, um, optical digit recognition uh, problem has been, you know, one of the hallmarks of machine learning. We can do it in two kilobytes of, of RAM, which I don't think anyone else can. I don't think anyone else really tried to, so maybe it's, I don't know if it's such an accomplishment, but we can do it on a little 8-bit processor at state-of-the-art accuracy. So we can match the accuracy of something that runs on a PC on a tiny little 8-bit microcontroller. Uh, but again, you know, we would, we haven't, I don't have, um, you know, graphs to show you that show how, how things degrade as we, as we go from, you know, two kilobytes to one and a half kilobytes to one kilobytes and, you know, basically to, to close to nothing. So okay. that's, that's an important and, and thing you, we should be able to show. The, your your top-down approach rec doesn't require the original data, right, because you're... You do need some data. You need, it doesn't need to be labeled. You need to be able to pass data through the original neural network so you can see what individual layers are doing. You're basically operating on a layer for layer basis. So you need to know what the inputs to the layer are and what the outputs are so you can try to mimic them with your binary you know, version of that layer. And for that, you need to pass data through it. But you're not using the labels of that data. You can just pass images. You can just have a camera and just you know, point right. around the room. And, and, but the bottom-up approach, you need the original data. Yeah, bottom-up approach right. is just standard machine learning, supervised training algorithms for you know, exotic classes of classifiers, not the standard you know, if you, if you open a, a standard textbook in machine learning, there'll be a section on, you know, linear classifiers and decision trees and neural networks. And, you know, these are, are, are kind of more old school but revamped uh, models that are much, much harder to train, like these KDNFs, which are kind of crazy. Um, you know, these, these decision trees that include these, these Fourier coefficients on the, on the edges. Um, so, so there, uh, you know, we need training data just like anybody else. And the difficulty there is solving the optimization problem. So, f so actually finding a, a, a predictor class that packs a ton of predictive capacity in a small footprint isn't that hard. I mean, the problem is, is finding something that I can also learn 
ideally with a convex op, uh, you know, optimization solution or some solution that I can reason about or, or, or prove guarantees on. I mean, you know, you can classify with like kraft truk polynomials or something. I mean, it'll probably pack a ton of capacity, but you know, who, who the hell knows how to train those things? So the, the delicate balance there is finding things that we can train and our recent innovations in combinatorial optimization and convex optimization and non-convex optimization and the analysis of, analysis of these techniques has been you know, what's allowed us to revisit these old school uh, types of classifiers and really learn them well. We have one last question here. Uh, hi. Uh, considering the binarization, uh, from my understanding, it's like a layer by layer, right? Uh, I, I'm wondering whether there will be more opportunity, like you can consider multiple layers together to mimic the operation, or that's too difficult uh, from the mathematical side? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a trade-off here, right? When you train a neural network, you're doing back propagation, you're going forward and backwards, and information is flowing in two directions. Here, when we're binarizing, we're trying to do it forward only. We're trying to take advantage of the fact that this architecture is deep, so you get multiple iterations to correct previous mistakes. I mean, every layer gets a chance to correct mistakes that you've made in the past. Sometimes we leave the last layer, you know, floating point, just because there's no one to correct its mistake, and that's not too bad, because it's usually pretty small. Um, so, uh, you know, we certainly do not have information flowing backwards, and it's a trade-off. If you want information to flow backwards, now you're in backprop territory, and, and you know, uh, that's great if you have the, the hardware, if you have the cluster of machines to support that, if you're willing to do the, you know, the parameters tuning and so on to, to make that thing work, that's great. Our uh, kind of goal was to get away from backpropagation, to now allow you to do this quickly and easily, you know, on a laptop-style machine. Um, and, you know, that's what, where we ended up with. If, if you want information to flow in, in, in multiple directions or if you want to involve multiple layers, your optimization problem is going to become much, much more, more complex. Thank you very much. Right. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much.